All right. It's in progress. Hey, everybody. I just want to <laughs> introduce you to Kate Fowler. Um, she's a professor at Duke and an author. And I would you tell us a little bit about your background bio and how you got to where you're at? Sure. I, yeah, I teach history at Duke. I, um, I have a very strange specialty. I study like the history of the idea that good things happen to good people. So I study people's religious, spiritual explanations for suffering. And, um, uh, and it, it, so I wrote this kind of giant history of, of this thing called the prosperity gospel, the idea that God wants to reward you with health and wealth and all the things in your heart, if you have a certain kind of faith. And, uh, so yeah, that's always been, um, kind of my, <laughs> my, my, you know, like academics are really only like good at one thing. That was like my one thing. And then, um, and then I, uh, really I've had just a lot of, um, just kind of random and sort of terrible things that happened. So I was diagnosed with stage four cancer when I was 35. And ever since I've become interested for even more reasons about how we explain the suffering and the hardship of others. So do you, did you grow up of a particular faith or how, how, what, what exactly initially since prior to having these sort of intense experiences of suffering, how did, how did, what sparked your interest about this? Well, I grew up uh, around Mennonites, which are this very, um, a, a people sort of with a reputation for um, simplicity and pacifism and an overwhelming desire to make furniture. And, uh, and I had been, um, so I, I'm Canadian and I was in my hometown of Winnipeg and I saw that this huge mega church had popped up. I thought honestly it was a factory and it turns out it was a church. And I realized that all kinds of Mennonite friends that I had went there, but also that they had a pastor who had just received a motorcycle from the congregation as a gift for a new holiday called pastor's appreciation day. And that he had driven the motorcycle around on stage. And I, I heard this and I was like, no, that is for Americans. And I was very insistent on that point. And then I realized, no, there's actually this, this rising movement of people who believe that God has blessed them with, um, with all kinds of you know, financial and um, health abundance. And so I just got really interested in the idea that I could like tell that story, but it came out of the fact that I was absolutely initially completely positive that my religious tradition was exempt. And it turns out that of course they weren't. Or what do you mean by that? Or your religious tradition being exempt? Well, if they're into uh, pacifism and simplicity and that they, you know, are just never far from like a, oh, okay. you know, a, a cheese festival where they made the cheese themselves. And I was like, a group like that isn't going to give their pastor a motorcycle. Um, but it turns out that, of course, uh, the prosperity gospel is just a very common way that a lot of a lot of us have in various forms of saying that like good things happen to good people and that if we're a certain kind of person be it either cheerful or um certain or that we always do the right thing that the right things always happen to us so yeah it ends up being much more common than i expected where do you sort of in sort of your timeline of how i mean i'm assuming faith as an evolving word for you, um, where do you kind of place yourself right now? Well, I, um, I guess one of the things that sort of kept me deeply hopeful is, was just having a different changed version of what I expected that faith would do in my life. So for a long time, I was hoping that it would feel like certainty that my life was going to turn out. And then it became something a little, a little softer, a little, a little more compassionate. I hope that um, that assumes that life is, life is really beautiful and life is really hard, and that um, that faith, like other good things, I hope, just will help us see other people more clearly. That we're all very fragile, <laughs> you know, and and in that, um, that nothing religion or otherwise is, is like an escape hatch. Nothing helps us. Nothing gives us the like, get out of jail free card for pain and, and hard times. But that's why, 
you know, that's why in my tradition, we need, we need God, but we also just really need each other. We need kind of love itself or else we're kind of screwed. Uh, I do think I w- I was hoping you would bring love into this equation. <laughs> Yeah, I'm into it. I think mostly because I know I, that love. I can't do it by myself. Yeah, I'm not, I mean, I'm not into asking for help, even though I know that uh, that's the only way forward because I just, I'm still kind of high on the individualism that we all drink. Like, yeah. Totally. yeah. I feel like, do you feel it as a, as a Canadian? How, what is your relation? And this is very tangential and we shouldn't go here, but I've been obsessed with American individualism yeah. for the past, I mean, ever since. Trump got elected it kind of like has been in the forefront of like why where how did that come from like America is so unique in its individualism and I feel like I associate Canadian culture as more collectivist yeah and it certainly has centralized solutions to like it does have a system that will nudge people toward the middle class whereas this just has a sort of ideology of the middle class um, like you can't go bankrupt for your financial problems as easily in Canada, for example. Um, but I think the the sort of traditions that I've studied that both went into the idea, the ideology of someone like Trump, but also into the prosperity gospel that I've studied was this this bootstrapping ideology where everyone is responsible for themselves, a very metaphysical series of ideas that um, that that right thinking people always end up on top winners and um and then the the sort of special sort of third uh strand that i'd studied was this version of pentecostalism that mm-hmm. said that if you have the right kind of spiritual faith that you'll that it'll um that that god will answer your prayers but people don't have to have that third bit to find these other two ideologies everywhere. Certainly Trump was actually, I mean, I've, I've written a lot about the religious biography of Trump. And, oh, really? I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, he that won't be your secret, but yeah. uh, no, but, but it was just secret to me. But anyway, wait, so can you, can you speak, do you mind speaking to that really quickly? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, he's the only presidential candidate who's ever had a pure prosperity gospel background. He went as a kid to one of the most famous prosperity churches, Marble Collegiate in uh, in New York City. He was raised on the, the ideology of the power of positive thinking from Norman Vincent Appeal. There's a, weirdly, because I just, I'm teaching a prosperity gospel course right now, all the books from that are like directly behind me. And so I feel like like taking them out like that. Um, he, his religious board of advisors was mostly te- the televangelists and prosperity preachers that I interviewed. So it was, a it was, and it has a, of course, like this super um, obsession with the American dream and himself as the sort of big deal maker. So yeah, a lot of, he's kind of the purest prosperity, uh, you know, really a political candidate we've ever had. I think it's, I mean, it's, it seems an extremely seductive yet crazy dangerous line of thought. Yeah. Yeah. The danger is that it tells suffering people that they are to blame when they can have it all their, you know, their wealth, their, um, their everything. It also makes it very um you know it, it it creates an invisible math so that other people are allowed to assess the pain of others and i think for me for me i'm not, i i think i sometimes fall risk to this in terms of um prof, prophetizing data or like because the data tells like a completely opposite story that like, or my understanding that like how difficult it is to overcome and how rare it is to overcome, but yet we still really want to believe that we can and the power that we have agency over our lives. And I, yeah, I, I'm I'm uncertain, <laughs> I'm, I'm about that at the moment. Yeah, um, I think helping people find that language between everything is possible and nothing is possible, like having a stronger account of limited agency is is going to be a much saner more loving place for us to be but yeah what's your take on free will at the moment <laughs> yeah well i'm uh i think that's i mean that's one of the great hopes for finding that limited place of limited agency is we really only get a few small hard choices in our life and and the rest is i mean most of us will be defined by the things that happen to us rather than the things we choose and and having just 
more uh, compassion for ourselves for that, compassion for others, and then I hope a propensity toward justice in the world in which we know that we need structures that hold us. Accountable. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'll take some of that. Yeah. Uh, Kate, will you tell us your secret? Yeah. Right. So this, the part of this is, uh, my, my philosophy on secrets is that we shouldn't have them. Or at least I feel in a very a state of luxury that I don't have to have a lot of secrets in that um, I think that I am blessed enough to be around people who, for the most part, accept me as I am. Um, yeah. And I think that there's something really magical about the idea of, of sharing information to a, a giant audience that's yeah. very personal that I that I am. Um, I, I delight in, but I also think that the more people, if you had like a wish, the more people who knew the wish um, would make a lot of sense that you would want to tell more people because they could help you. But if you keep your wish to yourself, it's, it's pretty yeah. much on your shoulders. I'm with you. I <laughs> could you I, think of something? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I I mean this in the least like. Um, in the, in the most honest way possible, I started writing because I was so overwhelmed by not knowing or not being able to tell the truth about how painful, how, how undone I felt like that when something really bad happened that I was ashamed to say that I, I, I kind of could, I knew I wasn't going to be able to get it together. Like I, I knew that there was just that the, you know, that I would never be able to figure out all the finances for my cancer or have the right attitude that would make everyone love me the whole time or that I, I got obsessed with the whole trying to look at the histories of cultural cliches because I felt so lonely in, um, in not being able to say that I just kind of knew that I was never going to be able to stick the landing. And I think that's hard because the the more you look like you have it together, the more people assume that you're going to always going to be okay. And I guess I kind of always knew I, that it was going to be really hard to be honest about that. So I kind of wrote it down because I knew that, um, I knew it was going to be hard to believe me. So, so after, after getting, after, I think the first, you wrote an op-ed, I think for, and submitted it to the New York times. <laughs> uh, how did that sort of, did, did that sort of give you the confidence that people needed to hear the sort of honest truth about anxiety surrounding pain and illness? Or did that, how did that, yeah. did that shape your, your comfort or build comfort with accepting kind of yeah. the broad range of emotions that an event like this could impose? I think, um, I think there's, I mean, I found a lot of like a lot of companionship, I guess, in the last few years, that's been really beautiful to me seeing, you know, it's that feeling you get when you're up close to other people who are just trying, like they're just trying and they might not be able to, um, and they're scared and they're overwhelmed. And I find being close to that is such a lovely, tender kind of place to be. So that, that has been really, that has been, and then I find so strange to just have that much, um, connection and solidarity with people that are not necessarily going to be like the the first circle you know what I mean like in the rings of our lives like they're not necessarily the people that I spend my everyday with but um that has been a huge source of comfort I think um it keeps being a, a huge source of comfort because sometimes I think the more people love you the more they're just unable to know that you're coming undone like because they they have to believe that you're going to be okay and so I think chronic pain chronic chronic suffering, chronic grief, our chronic lives are hard for other people to kind of keep the truth of in their minds. So sometimes we just need someone to tell our secrets to, I think, and they may or may not be our first circle, our, our iPhone favorites. I think that I, I personally have bad boundaries in the sense that I feel a lot more comfortable sometimes telling people that I don't know, or a sort of digital audience that may or may not exist, um, a painful truth that is existing 
and there I, I do I'm I'm really glad I I do want to tell you I I am such a fan but I am so like I feel like your book is incredibly deep and consuming and hilarious oh. I mean uh, there's like the the way that you're just really funny as well and I feel like people don't people don't necessarily tell you um or maybe they do tell you that you're like the way that you use humor I feel like is really smart and um seems sort of the irony of of every situation but I I really I really am thankful to have become exposed to everything that you do and um I really, really wish you the best of luck. I don't want to like give away anything that happens or any sort of like the final kind of struggle. I can't believe they let me call the book No Cure for Being Human. I'm like, do you know right. that people don't let you say it in parties? I, 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 yeah, I love them. Thank you for letting me talk about my gentle despair. I do like it very much. <laughs> oh, I, I also really like, did you, gentle despair. How poetic is that? Lovely. Um, Kate, thank you so much for having me or for having me for, for being here with me and, um, everybody, if you could pick up a copy or pre-order or just call me and I'll talk you through the outline, uh, of the book. Um, and, and <laughs> thank you, and hon. Have tea together. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.